Okay, hi everyone. I'd like to include, um, uh, introduce the members of our closing discussion panel. Uh, first, we have Dr. Bridget Hard, who is actually full professor of practice, <laughs> right, in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke University. We also have joining us uh, Dr. Veronica Yan, uh, who is an assistant professor in educational psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. We also have joining us Dr. Daniel Bruce uh, Brewer DeLuce, who is an assistant professor in the sc School of Kinesiology at Western University. And finally, we also have Ariana Davids. She recently graduated uh, from PNB at McMaster University. And I know her very well because she's also served as the head teaching assistant for uh, the McIntyre Psych program at McMaster University, which teaches over 5,000 students a year. So in our closing discussion panel, um, I had some questions that I wanted us to reflect upon uh, to kind of summarize all the different ideas that we've talked about first. And I'm going to get each panelist like, a couple of minutes to um, answer these questions and get some initial thoughts, and then maybe we'll have some discussion going as well. And our first question was, what are your key suggestions for modern universities to build better learning environments? Uh, and maybe for this first question, we can start off with Bridget. Um, so, you know, just a reminder of a context, like I teach at, at Duke University, which is really thought of as a research university. And I think one of the most important things is modern universities need to show that they value teaching in the way that they incentivize faculty. So there are plenty of universities that really value and respect teaching and teaching is just a critical part of their culture. But there are a lot of universities that don't. Um, and at least they sell to the undergrads, oh yes, like we have great teaching, but then the faculty are not rewarded at all for good teaching. And in fact, they seem often to be rewarded for teaching as little and as poorly as possible because then they can get more publications and big grants. So I think honestly, this is the most important thing is we need to shift the culture in all universities to show that this teaching is why we're here. We couldn't have a university <laughs> without it. And we need to start putting more resources and, and love toward training and supporting our teachers. And perhaps that teaching, high quality teaching is just as prestigious yes. as high quality research, which just sounds- as And just as, yeah. or more challenging even. Like it's a, it's a challenging thing that deserves a lot of respect. Yeah. Veronica. I had a similar thought in terms of not thinking about the physical environment, mm -hmm. but really thinking about the culture, the mental context mm -hmm. that the university in general promotes. So in terms, following on what Bridget was saying, in terms of making sure that we are creating you know, more collaborative or cooperative versus more uh, competitive and punitive types of cultures within our classrooms and the university more broadly. Um, in terms of also, I think it's a really important, and I don't think we do this enough with faculty preparation, faculty development, faculty training, in terms of really emphasizing having a supportive culture, a supportive classroom doesn't mean you're making things easier for students. I think that's oftentimes the fear that we'll be lowering our standards or um, just, you know, passing people through. But I think if we're thinking about a real, like, learning culture, that's one that is both demanding and then supportive for students to actually thrive through those demands. Um, well, just a quick follow-up. Where do grades fit in there uh, in this view of yours? I think realistically, uh, grades are important because internships are often determined by grades, whether you get into med school or various professional tracks are determined by grades. I don't think that grades need to go, but I think there are a lot of things we can do to focus on mastery of content. So in part, it requires that we aren't just getting giving A's for the sake of giving A's, but separate from grades, separate from student evaluations, we're really taking a step back and thinking about what do I want students in my program? What are the skills? And as well as the content knowledge, I want the students in my program to actually know. So I think physics is one of those fields that does it fairly well. So um, they have the force and concept, forces concepts inventory in physics, which is what should a physics student know by the end of their first year? Um, or things like nursing programs, they have actual like, like state exams or standards. They accreditations. Have to, accreditations yeah. they have to meet. But we don't have that for most programs in university. And I think we do need to take a step back and think, what are our broader goals for our students beyond our specific classroom? Um, and then 
try to meet those. In that case, like you need grades because you need to see if they're meeting those standards. But it is also wonderful if everyone can meet those with flying colors. Okay. So I'd love to hear your view, Danielle, uh, as a newer faculty member. Mm -hmm. And we talked about earlier in this day, uh, it's all these amazing things that we want teachers to do, but I mean, it could be really challenging. So, you know, what, what's your answer to this question? Yeah, so I thought about it in terms of like the use of space. So especially with the transition online lately, I've been thinking a lot about how do we use the spaces that we're in most effectively. And so some things are better online, absolutely. But some things we need to do face to face. And so I've been thinking a lot about how do we make sure that we are occupying the right spaces for the right content and using them to the best of our ability. So if I'm going to ask you to come to lab, what am I offering you there that you can't get online? And if I'm going to offer you lectural modules, so the courses I teach have enrollment around a thousand, so quite large, and I've shifted my lectures online, well, that's turned out to be a really good thing because I can be really thoughtful about the content that we're offering and then use like the face-to-face -face time for more of that engagement. And so I think if modern universities are gonna be successful, especially now that we've done some of this flipped classroom or high flex or fully online sort of business that we need to be really making sure we're using those spaces appropriately uh, each time. Okay, so as a, as a newer faculty member, how about resources and time to make all of this happen? How does that work? Great question. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, time is always the, the limiter, right? Um, for me, it was about trying to be really thoughtful about the way that I did things the first time around so that I could continually iterate from a base I was fairly happy with. The other side of this is one of my postdoc supervisors taught me this, is sometimes good enough is, is good enough. And figuring out which aspects are non-negotiable and which things are kind of nice to have has been really important for me as new faculty because you literally can't do it all in, in a day or a semester or a year. You know, you, you really have to be selective about the things that you want to do really well and then kind of progressively build over time. Okay, so that's a theme that came up in yeah. the other talks as well. Like you have to kind of sort of pick your battles and then think of this as an iterative process exactly. to make incremental improvements. Yeah. Okay, so the target uh, of all of this thought is uh, is you, Ariana, and, and students uh, that you represent. So we'd love to hear your perspective as a student. Yeah, well, I think when we're looking at the modern university, we're talking a lot about universities that are shifting from fully in-person to more kind of online platforms. And I think that's great. I think it gives great flexibility. But as a student, um, one of the things that I found really, really difficult was watching uh, professors do things that they thought would be beneficial, include activities in online classrooms, um, but doing it just so that it was there. Uh, breakout rooms for breakout rooms sake, without any thought as to um, what really worked best in a breakout room or how that could really facilitate learning. Uh, same with online discussion boards and other kind of forums. They were often done. I know Dr. Tony Bates talked a lot about, you know, having these activities if you're going to do a fully online classroom. And so I just think that modern universities, as they make a little bit of a shift to more online, to really make sure that students are getting the most out of these activities that they choose to do, to really have a thought behind why they're choosing this activity. And, you know, I know I've been in a ton of breakout rooms that were silent for several minutes. I know this is a very common student experience, but I've been in breakout rooms that were fantastic and I made friends and I took things out of it. Um, so I just think that to take the time to really kind of like talking about space in terms of physical space versus online space. If you're doing something online for that socialization aspect that's lost so often online, to make sure that there is real thought into why that activity is being chosen and what students are actually getting out of it so it doesn't feel like a checklist item, essentially. So it sounds like it's been a varied experience for students, it, learning online and blended uh, during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I've had all kinds of experiences uh, in, in this modern world. I've had classes fully online, classes fully in person, the high flex classroom. You can join from online or you can show up in class and it's all just live streamed. And I mean, I found varied experiences even in the same kind of like online classrooms. I think that when professors are designing the classrooms, like we've talked about uh, quite a bit, you know, you do have to take time to think about what's going to be online because for some students, that's just 
I mean, that's simply not going to work. I think we've talked about, you know, how it's better for adult students to be online. And I think that's the same in, with fourth year students. I think you can get away with fourth year students in the same cohort who have known each other for quite some time, uh, doing a class online and being in breakout rooms, because these are with people that they've known for three years. And they, you know, you go into a random breakout room, you see three people and you know them already. They're not strangers. So I think the experience varies. And let's imagine only. their cameras are off too. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. oh my gosh. <laughs> Cameras is a whole other, that's a whole other story. But um, yeah, I think that the experience varies not only like student by student, but also by, by year and by faculty and, and by the type of classroom that the teacher's trying to set up or the professor. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to our next question. Maybe we'll start with Veronica on this. And so I know that we're all interested in this meeting about evidence-based practice for teaching, but maybe it's sometimes not even practical to do a research study on something. So this is kind of a fun question. What's a teaching tip unsupported by research that nevertheless you swear by? So one thing I do, and it kind of links to what Ariana was saying, is a lot of community building first in my classroom. But um, for context, the class that I teach is about 60 to 80 undergrads, depending on the semester, and about 40 to 60% of them are freshmen. Their first years, they especially in the fall semester, they may not know very many people and or really just in general, even if they're not first years, they don't necessarily know people in the class. But I have a lot of um, activities and peer learning going through my class, but before they can engage in that productively, they need to feel comfortable with each other. So, and especially, that became especially important in the pandemic when people could actually no longer be in person. So I do a lot of community building. So this is things like, um, icebreakers in that first week where you try to find five things that are you guys all have in common within your group that you don't think anyone else will have and then you have to create a little poster to represent that um icebreak mini icebreakers at the beginning of every group activity class uh, where you will you know um you know what would be your like if you were you know what is your like i think one of the questions was what is your what would be the song that they would play when you like walked into a wrestling ring like what is your like <laughs> pump up song um and also then building a lot of uh, engagement and self-relevance to people's lives within the activities themselves. So for example, I teach a class about, I teach about expertise and in the activity I have them do is I have them like, have someone be the expert in the group where they're actually sharing something about their expertise. So I've learned, for example, that in my classes, I've had a um, champion cup stacker, like solo cup stacking, that's a thing, they have competitions. Um, I've had someone who forages for wild mushrooms and can tell you what, like, what kind of mushroom it is and where to look for them and how to find secret places. And you learn, like, learning so much about the students as individual people. I think that's been so important, and it's something that then really changes the dynamics of how people are willing to interact with each other and with me. Okay, really interesting ideas. Uh, how about you, Danielle? Uh, so I'd agree with that sort of community statement and like trying to develop that sort of community, especially in an online space. So um, while formative feedback is something that I think a lot of us do anyways and is evidence-based, um, seeking that regularly throughout the term and like giving students an opportunity to ask questions uh, in an online forum is something I do quite often. Um, now it's a little bit different from discussion boards, more kind of like a, I think a Google survey sort of setup. So I've been doing that fairly often uh, with the, uh, Mixed results, uh, but when it does work, it's fantastic. Uh, perhaps more importantly, one thing I, I was in a talk recently uh, by Jesse Stommel, and he said, you know, start by trusting students. And as I approached assessment, especially uh, on online and what we were going to do with that, um, that for me and that kind of idea provided a lot of freedom because I started to think, you know, do we really need to be doing online proctoring? Do we really need to be doing all of these extra pieces? And I know that's been a lot of uh, a bit of a stumbling block for myself and a lot of my colleagues and just kind of coming back to that piece of trusting students and that, you know, they are here for their learning um, kind of took a bit of a weight off that way for me. That's that's really a, a great way to look at it. Start by trusting students, because I definitely interact with um, like faculty members who have the opposite view, like they're up to something. I know that if I don't regulate every single aspect, they're going to do that. And, you know, I think in any situation, there are going to be some 
uh, people that cheat the system in anything, not just in school, but if that's where 100% of your focus is, it's probably wasted energy. Oh, absolutely, right? And it's always easier almost to slip into that, like, how can I make this cheat proof? Well, the answer is you can. <laughs> like, good, good luck. Um, but yeah, it, it, okay. it's kind of freeing in a sense to step back and be like, all right, I'm just not going to worry about this piece and instead focus on teaching the best that I can and interacting with students. Well, that, that's really interesting. I think it's something I just subconsciously thought of, but never actually heard it stated like that. So, well, okay, thank you for that. So, Ariane, as head TA, what sort of teaching tips do you give to your fellow TAs? Well, I guess context is important here. Um, TAing intro psych means that you're primarily interacting with uh, first year students, people who are just coming to university. Um, and we're also not much older. We TA when we're undergrads. So it's only a couple years age difference. Um, and we're usually also some of the first TAs that these students encounter. Um, we TA pretty early in the week. So oftentimes second week of school, they're in, they're in our classrooms. Um, and I found that students are a little bit apprehensive because it's the, the first tutorial, because they've just started university and they look at professors NTAs, they look, they look up to them and they almost see them as, you know, this otherworldly kind of being. And so I found that the best thing to do is to take your course material seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. I've actually found a ton of success in making fun of myself and teasing myself from the outset because I teach a small class, it's 26 students. And once you do that, I think it humanizes you. I think you become more relatable and I think like we've mentioned, community is important. And I think it makes it permissible for students to tease you too. And I think you can kind of get a banter going. I think it can make things fun to learn when you're kind of brought down to the level of like, yeah, I'm just a student. I make mistakes. You can see me making mistakes. It's okay for you to make mistakes. We're all kind of in this together. I bet when they start the class and they look at you, they think like, oh my, she must know everything. Like she's like the TA. Like I bet she doesn't make any mistakes. Dr. Kadia once got an email saying that um, in our classroom, we have a lot of laughs. They're always at my expense. <laughs> <laughs> so I think anything, any, all of that fades, fades quite quickly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. How about you, Bridget? Yeah. So I, I have a, a number of, of things actually, but there's one that I'm sure there is kind of like indirect evidence to support, but I'm just so convinced it's true I don't even bother to look, and that's stories as a really powerful tool for teaching. Like I really do believe that stories are like the original pedagogical technique. You know, think about all the time in human history when we didn't even have written language, and so the only way we could transmit information was orally. And I think stories are this kind of like little like technology that we created to help us do that. And I just love stories so much, whether it's in like a lecture format or even in like a discussion when you're just trying to build rapport with students. I think about the ways you use Monica, little stories about Monica, right? <laughs> like stories just make content feel personal. They make it feel like it's tied to your everyday experience. They provide a kind of a framework for organizing the ideas and the material. <laughs> and they're just so darn memorable. Like, I, I mean, I'm sure you experienced students coming back and like, they don't remember maybe anything else, but they remember the story of Monica doing whatever funny thing she yeah. does, right? Yeah. And I just, I have stories from my own like middle school science classes that my teacher used to tell. And I like, couldn't remember any of the science concepts, but I remembered all the stories. But critically, if he could plug the concepts into the stories and like weave them together, it yeah. just really was so powerful. So I'm I totally on board with you with that. Uh, I don't know of any like explicit evidence for it, but I'm convinced that telling stories, weaving them into your lectures, it really resonates with students and also like, you know, humanizing yourself, like, you know, self-deprecating humor. To me, like, I love hearing self-deprecating humor. Like, I just find it just very, like, it, it just totally disarms people, makes them, um, makes you human. So I remember during the pandemic lectures, I was sitting in on uh, one of uh, Michelle's lectures, and she had this feature where in the middle, uh, while ask, um, there was a quiz question, students could type in any, it was like an ask me anything session. And they would ask her things like, oh, what do you like doing when you're not working? Like, I heard that you like D&D, &D. is that true? 
and she would just answer a few of these questions, and the students just loved it because it just kind of humanizes like this mythical figure uh, to them uh, even more. So I thought that was just like a great idea. Okay, so moving to kind of more theoretical research, what's an important area of teaching that actually needs more rigorous research? And maybe we can start with Danielle on this one. Yeah, so in my opinion, especially as we've been moving online, um, I'm a, an anatomist by training and, and we see a lot of fun new kind of apps coming out to display anatomy and I'm sure this is happening in all sectors, but with the movement online and into a digital sphere, I think we need to be really careful and conscious about the technology we're bringing into our classrooms and making sure that it's actually working well for students and actually supporting learning. So just picking up a tool because it is bright and shiny and looks cool uh, isn't enough in, in my opinion. And so I think we need to put the work in to make sure that we are researching these new advances um, to make sure they are actually helpful. Yeah, and so I think this kind of ties in with what we said earlier about <clears throat> just using a tool because you have a tool is not going to make it a good pedagogical choice. Uh, so we have to actually really do a lot of research. And I know, I think, you, did you work with Bruce Wayneman? Yeah, so with Bruce, like he's done a lot of, well, you and others with Bruce have done lots of research showing that just because you have a fancy virtual reality tool for these three-dimensional flybys, it's not necessarily the best way to learn anatomy. Maybe sometimes just having a model uh, in front of you is actually even better. Yeah. So lots of important research that needs to be done before people actually use specific tools. Let's go back to Ariana. Yeah, so one thing that's been really relevant to me as a TA um, has actually been cold calling. So it's been a topic I have with TAs all the time. Do you cold call your students? When someone doesn't raise their hand to answer a question, do you just pick someone? Um, and all the research that I seem to see says that it's great and supports this inclusive uh, environment and it brings people out of their shell and it gets them to participate. But that feels so antithetical to my experience, to the experience of everyone I know. I consider myself to be extroverted and I like to participate in tutorials. I like learning. But if you cold call, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm going into a shell. Um, so I was just looking at some of the research recently to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. Um, and every study that I see compares cold calling to like voluntary participation. And I get that when no one has their hand raised and you have a question, um, cold calling seems like a fine thing to do, but voluntary participation and cold calling seem like two ends of a spectrum. So I just like to see a lot of research that looks at things in the middle, um, you know, group work to get people out of their shell and participating. Uh, you can use other techniques like think, pair, share, where you pose a question and if no one raises their hand, you give them 30 seconds to think on their own, share with a partner beside them, and then you can pose the question to the class again. And I just think there are so many things in between vol full voluntary participation and cold calling that aren't really looked at a ton in the research. Um, so yeah, more rigorous research on cold calling, please. I don't like <laughs> That's it. really interesting because I think my nightmare scenario thinking about cold calling is like, you know, you've seen like those law school scenarios in movies like, Ariana, can you summarize the case study that we're about to discuss? And then they just jump around like, like cold calling Socratic method. Like it just seems really, it would be anxiety provoking all the time. It feels hostile yeah. to me as a student and as a TA, I don't like doing it. Like I, I've mm -hmm. never cold called on a student because I, I can just see the fear in a student's <clears throat> eye if you look at them even. Uh, we mark participation, so always try to encourage people to participate. And if you know it's someone's weak, they're, that they're really being looked at for participation, you might look at them a little bit and try to get them, try to egg them on. But no way am I call, calling on you. Like that's not, that's not making a fun community environment in my perspective. So I don't No, I think it's an interesting area that could use some more research. And there's an idea that one of our um, presenters at EdCog uh, a couple years ago, uh, Ji Sun, she has this really interesting idea where she has in her lecture hall a splash zone. Mm -hmm. So this is an area where if you sit, you can be cold called. Right, so the rest you're safe, right? So you don't have this anxiety uh, every time you step into a lecture. But I think she actually rotates people through the splash zone, and they are the ones that can be cold called. But 
in a safe, supportive way. Um, and uh, she says it works for her. Um, and then it's you know, kind of tying to the research I was talking about. I bet they're really attentive. And I really bet that they're a focus of the lecture hall. And so maybe they can serve as the attentive models for the rest of the lecture. I don't, some, kind, of, kind of sounds like an interesting area of collaborative research for the future. My Bridget? Mind is blown. That's such a neat idea. <laughs> like, oh, I want to do that this fall and, and do a, 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 collect some data on it. Um, this, I think, my idea kind of builds a little bit on Ariana's and that, you know, you think about the, what's coming to mind for you when you think about being cold called and, and it's sort of this feeling of fear, right? And I think, for me, I think there's a, a really unknown frontier out there on the connection between our emotions and our learning experience. And I'm a cognitive psychologist by training, so I'm all thinking about thoughts and beliefs and perceptions. But emotions are these powerful forces that shift our behavior in different directions, right? When we feel afraid, we, we freeze in our step, right? We don't move. When we feel curious, we want to move forward and explore, right? And I think that there's so much of learning that's really tied to creating different emotional experiences in your students. And I think for many of us, when we think about like our best class, classes we ever took or like our favorite teachers, these are people who like took you on this emotional journey. And, and when you were on the emotional journey, they and you and everybody else were all together, like experiencing the same highs and the lows and the nuances. And I just think we don't know very much at all about what's happening. Mm. And I, I think that that is a really interesting space mm. to explore, like moving beyond things like anxiety, but fear and su ooh, surprise. Surprise is a really important emotion <laughs> in learning, right? But like thinking about how, how do we affect those? How do we influence those? And what exactly do they do in the learning process? Yeah. No, you know, as a card-carrying cognitive psychologist, I've been increasingly recognizing that um, emotion and uh, mental health is a complete part of the human experience. Uh, that's also part of learning, right? And I think for me, one of the highlights of our introductory psychology class is that on the last day of lecture, um, I, I, actually it's Paulina that does this, we assemble this photo essay that we call like the human experience. And it's just like photos of people experiencing different emotions and situations. And it's always paired with, it's, it's almost like a, you know, at the end of camp, and then they have like a really like perfect song that goes with all these pictures. And we play it and we say, you know, understanding psychology is understanding the human experience. And then it plays for like two minutes. And at the end, like, you know, half the class is crying, <laughs> right? But then they also walk away thinking, of, wow, that's why we learned all this. And like it's a it's a great final powerful experience that they have. Veronica. Oh, I like it. with every response, I'm like, I've got a million different ideas and different thoughts going on. Um, but <laughs> the thought that I initially had with this question is whenever I'm talking to people about here's what the research is sh showing in terms of the cognitive research, the metacognitive, the motivational research, the most frequent question I get is. Yeah, but does it work? Would it work for my class? Would it work for mm -hmm. my students? Would it work for my subject? And I think we're starting to move that way in the psychology field, but we have not been great at looking at heterogeneity mm -hmm. and looking at not just main effects, but moderators, interactions, looking at what there, whether there might be differences between disciplines with age groups. And I think what we need to do is Look, a lot of it is the same questions, but looking at it in a deeper way, in a different, slightly different way. And I think we'll, we'll be surprised both by homogeneity as well as heterogeneity. I think there are a lot of things where we'll be surprised and comforted <laughs> by how consistent those effects can be across different levels, across different disciplines. And I think those are some core things that'd be really, really important then to like actually communicate. But then I think there are so many contextual effects, so many cultural effects, so many discipline-based effects where the just, just saying, you know, doing this, that may not work in that instance, but then we alert, we'd learn so much more about why um, it wouldn't. And I think, you know, you know, like there's loads of great new questions, but also the same old questions we've been studying, we can actually do a lot more. That, that, that's a great point. I think... 
most of what we talk about in this field at this conference has to do with STEM in higher education, right? So we, we're, we desperately need more information and data on what happens with all these other disciplines and what happens outside of higher education. So, uh, we, you know, we have high school teachers that are attending this conference and increasingly, I'm getting more and more interested in like, what happens, you know, at high school? Uh, what can we do to help students transition more effectively to university? So I think this is an under-researched area that, uh, you know, we should all try to contribute to. Okay, we're gonna jump to our final question of the panel. How do you motivate students to become lifelong learners? Ariana, how do you do it? Yeah, so I think one thing that you can do um, as a professor and as a teacher is to be enthusiastic about what you're teaching. I feel like that energy is contagious. I think that that's a great way to start. Um, but I think a big thing that kind of makes it difficult for students to be lifelong learners is a, a lot of the way that university is set up. Um, I mean, you have to do well in your courses to apply to grad school, to apply to med school, and that is the unfortunate truth. And so I feel like a lot of students get into the mindset where they have to do everything they can to get the best mark that they can, regardless of whatever else that means. Um, and so I think that one way that we can kind of combat this mindset where grades take priority over learning is to build failure into courses or opportunities for failure into courses. Um, alternative grading schemes, the ability to draw something if your mark is extremely low on it. Uh, and I don't really see it as making things easier for students. Uh, I really see it as a way for students to be able to kind of experiment, try out new things, do something that's maybe a little bit riskier without the fear that if it goes poorly, uh, that it's over for them and they can't get the, the fantastic grade that they need. Uh, so I think that working to kind of build that failure into courses will really help students uh, focus less on that final grade and more about what they're learning on the way. What do you think of that idea? I think that was at our university of like, uh, I think they called it like a freedom course where you could take any course on a pass fail basis so that you might be kind of um, more experimental in what elective you take. No, I think that's great. I know there are a lot of people in a lot of institutions that look down on pass fail because it's seen as a way to, you know, take a course and not do a ton of work. But I think that's the wrong mindset about pass fail courses. Like, yes, certainly some people are going to do that if they have the option to pass fail a course. But I think that's looking at it from such a negative angle. I think that when you allow people to take pass fail courses, it allows them to take things outside of their discipline without the worry that it's going to essentially tank their GPA. I know the route that I took in university, I actually did a, a BA in psychology because it gave me more freedom to take a bunch of courses uh, outside of science that I found very interesting. And that's something that I found very, very valuable. And so I'd love for that to become more accepted um, for people to say, yeah, I took a pass fail course, but it's because I wanted to learn more about coding because coding is important, even though I'm in psychology. Um, yeah, I think it's great. Okay, thank you. Bridget? I think. One important thing in trying to develop students to be lifelong learners is to model what lifelong learning looks like, like to show it in the way that we talk about things. So um, I'm always recommending podcasts to students. <laughs> like I'm saying, oh, I just listened to this really cool podcast. If you want to learn more about pain perception, you should check this out. Or, oh, I just read this new study. And so I'm always trying to incorporate into my teaching, the things that I'm learning or that I've just recently learned and showing mm -hmm. how happy I am about that, that I'm really excited I learned this new thing um, or being curious with students. So when students ask a question that you don't have the answer to, which we know they do all the time, um, just really appreciating that. And I mean, so there's, you know, like sample scripts you can use for this. Like student asks a question like, whoa, I have no idea. That's so interesting. What do you think would happen? I haven't thought about that before. Oh, but I can't wait to look that up. And so there's like ways we respond to student questions that highlight mm -hmm. how much we enjoy getting to learn and how much we want them to keep learning. And so I think there's a lot of things we do in interacting with students that model enjoying learning even at our age or whatever. And, and also that that's something we want to nurture in them is asking questions, is being curious. Is something I, that we yeah, really I, re I, I really com totally agree with you on that. Modeling uh being that lifelong learner um and um even admitting when you don't know something so i've been teaching introductory psychology for 14 years now and so i've almost heard all the questions 
right? So it's not often that I get asked an original question in lecture, but sometimes I do. And, it's, and uh, sometimes I really don't know the answer. And uh, I actually love those moments. And like, I'll tell a student, that is such a good question. Like, I don't know the answer. And like, maybe no one knows the answer to this. And, and it does two things. One, like, I don't know everything. And uh, I get things wrong. And this person is, has shown such insight. Um, and I think it's an opportunity. And then like you can do some research and then you follow. So that's why I tell all my TAs as well. If you don't know something, that's fine. Oh yeah, you, and don't, then, you don't have to know the like, answer. I want you to even say, I don't know. And that also humanizes you too and takes you off this pedestal. Yeah. And then uh, you could come back and you could show your curiosity of like, this is what I did some research on. And like, yeah, it turns out actually no one really knows. Uh, you also, maybe you should do a thesis on this. Yeah, you can also do that even though with the question that you've heard 40 times. So you do get the same questions, but it's still a great question. Yeah. And then you can still say, that is such a good question. It's such a good question that this other research team thought the same thing. And then they went and studied it. And yeah. so you're still reinforcing it and, and almost acting like it's still new. It's <laughs> I, not, I, mean, it's I could see the excitement in your face even just describing that. So I love when you're talking about competing theories. Uh -huh. And they're like, yeah, so that's why people thought this. And it made sense. Turns out it was completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Emotional journey. Yeah. Yeah. The students on. How about you, Veronica? I mean, very similar things. So I was thinking, you know, we want to not just say, hey, here's a bunch of information for you to learn, but focus on the process. How was it that it was discovered? Why was there this question in the first place? Why could there have been other answers? And then showing them like, hey, this is how knowledge is actually created versus thinking that knowledge is just something that is a reality. It's there or it's not. It's true or it's not true. And it's just a bunch of things to memorize. And if we think about, you know, the educational experience that a student collectively has across all their different classes, it's implicitly giving them an idea of what learning is supposed to look like. It, are students leaving our universities thinking that being a lifelong learner means sticking your nose in a book and just like reading for hours and hours, trying to memorize and cram a bunch of facts? Are we really modeling the type of learning that we think of learning as? Um, and if not, how can, might we actually try to model those things, structure those things in our classes, change the focus of how we're teaching, what we're teaching, to really motivate that piece. Because to be a lifelong learner, as you got like the excitement that Bridget has, like I heard this really cool podcast, or we like, you know, there's this really cool documentary. Being a lifelong learner is fun, but we don't communicate that very well usually to our students. All right, Danielle, last word to you. Yeah, so I look at it kind of from two perspectives. Uh, one is I try and find a way to make sure the content that, I'm, content that I'm teaching aligns well with something that the student is actually interested in. And so finding ways to tie whatever I'm talking about to real life or something that's going to, you know, they can bring home and, you know, tell their partner, or tell their roommate or something like this is something cool that actually matters to my everyday life. And so I think if you can do that a few times and you can start kind of setting up a context or a place for whatever it is you're working on in their life, it, it automatically encourages them to want to know more. The other thing I've been really cognizant of this year is, um, especially with uh, first year students, is giving them the tools to be successful. So I started my course this year with a lecture on how to study, because many of these students don't know how to study well and think that rereading or highlighting is where it's at. Turns out, not the most effective thing, but no one's ever told them that. And so if you can teach them more effective ways, demonstrate how to do that, build it into the course so it's kind of a package deal, we're actually arming them with the, you know, the things that they need to succeed beyond our course. Uh, and I think that's really how we create these lifelong learners. All right. Thank you, Danielle, and all of our panelists for uh, your insightful comments. That brings us to the conclusion of our meeting this year.